Macho 90 Even after 50 years, just the title alone seems to annoy some people. No, no, no! There are several reasons for this, and one of them is the misconception that having a child character as the star automatically means that the series is much more child-friendly than previous Anderson shows. Oh, it's less exciting than Thunderbirds, oh, it's not as spectacularly violent as Captain Scarlet, and so on and so forth. Bunch of amateurs until you actually watch the show and realize that it's every bit as exciting as Thunderbirds and just as dark and violent as Captain Scarlet, if not more so, incredibly enough. That's life, Joe, in the W.I.N. Setting aside for a moment the extremely questionable morality inherent in the show's very premise, because that would be a video all its own, we invite you now to come with us as we take you on a tour of Joe 90's Top 5 Darkest Moments to prove once and for all that young Joe really wasn't kidding around. Joe 90? Come on! Come on! Number 5. The Massive Body Count of Splashdown You will find it's a most interesting project. While not as immediately obvious as it is in episodes like Winged Assassin or Operation Crash Dive, Splashdown once again presents us with the charming notion of dozens of people being killed in plane crashes at sea. As this episode opens, two aircraft have already been deliberately crashed in order to cover terrorist kidnappings of leading scientists that were passengers on each flight. Sam Louver points out, In both cases, theirs were the only bodies not recovered. Which, once again, is an uncomfortably familiar real-life detail that we'd rather not have to think about. Who's flying a plane? No one. Shane Weston plans to place Professor McLean on the next flight on the same route. Thanks very much. And sure enough, the same thing happens again. But of course, this time, Joe 90 is on hand to save the day. Smashing! It turns out that the kidnapped scientists are being transferred by boat to this submarine before being taken on elsewhere. But this time, WIN have called in the Navy to stop them. Hold them just a little longer, Joe. The naval patrol is nearly with you. Excellent work. So now we can force them to surrender and thus find out where the missing scientists are being held. Okay, we'll, we'll just do that. <laughs> Hope those kidnapped scientists enjoy their stay with the Eastern Alliance. You have a very strange sense of humor. Now, while most of the inherent darkness of this particular story is kept very much off screen, at least we don't get to see any of the bodies, there are still one or two bits of unpleasantness that we are treated to, such as this charming shot of the stewardess who helped with Max kidnapping, trembling in fear for her life when one of her male colleagues threatens to blow her brains out. You will pay for that! Blimey. Number 4. The Sergeant's Death from Colonel McLean Yes, sir. Faced with an impassable mountain road, Colonel Joe McLean and his men, Private Johnson and an unnamed sergeant, decide to go around it by driving up the side of the mountain itself. Oh my god! This works fine at first, as Joe and Johnson make it to the top safely, but when the sergeant follows them, the tree holding his truck's weight suddenly gives way and he tumbles back down the mountainside, right into the remaining truck, which is of course packed with explodium as per Jerry Anderson lore. This is a particularly standout moment because the poor old sergeant doesn't get killed by some bad guy with a gun, he gets killed in a simple accident that was nobody's fault and nobody's intention. And what particularly sells the moment is that the episode goes out of its way to make the sergeant as likeable as possible. 13 years has taught me one thing. Do as you're told, quick and smart, and you don't go far wrong. And while I'm around, you'll do the same. So that when he is suddenly and brutally blown to bits, you really feel the void left by his absence. The shot of Joe and Johnson watching the burning wreckage of the trucks, with Johnson slowly lowering the radio into which he had just been speaking to his friend and colleague, is a particularly poignant one, and a fine example of the level of emotional maturity this supposed kiddie show was capable of reaching. Steady, lad. Steady. It's genuinely really sad, and all this for a character that we never actually learn the name of. Sergeant to you. Well, we've got top brass around anyway. Number 3. The Execution Scene from Three's a Crowd Have you anything to say? 
Yep, can't not mention this one. The next time you hear anybody dismiss Joe 90 as being too kid-friendly, this is the scene to show them. Because it's staggeringly inappropriate for a child audience. Of course. Three's a crowd opens in a rundown fortress in the middle of nowhere, where this poor chap is staked out before a firing squad being lectured by the general about how much of a failure he is. Firing squad. Halt. This charming scene is being watched by two men and a woman, who have been brought here to see what will happen to them if they should ever fail the general. You know that failure cannot be tolerated. Yes, General. With the pep talk over, the general moves to a safe distance and then gives the order. Take him. Fire! And with that little bit of business taken care of, the general now has some words of encouragement for the watchers. If you work for me, success is amply rewarded. But fail and you will suffer the same fate as the wretch you have just seen executed. Well, I'm sure we've all had a boss like this. Do not expect mercy if you fail. What makes this even more ghoulish is that most of the rest of the episode is mostly a sweet little character story based largely in Max Cottage, as the General's female operative tries to seduce the good professor in order to learn his secrets. Please, Miss Davis, uh, come sit down. You've aroused my curiosity. However, we eventually learn that she spends much of her time trying not to think about what will happen if she fails, which is a bit difficult when she is still haunted by the sound of the gunfire from the execution, and no, we're not joking. Remember the jungle? The waiting in the courtyard? No. The sound of the firing squad? Failure cannot be tolerated. Stop! Needless to say, Joe is merciless when it comes to using this weakness against her. But then again, she was a bit dismissive of him earlier, so it probably balances out in his poor little mind. What are you, some sort of devil? Yes. This is unbelievable. Number 2. Breakout. All of it. Yeah, where to start with this one? I sure would like to get to the bottom of this. Breakout is perhaps the most violent Supermarionation episode ever made, as two escaped convicts go on the rampage in the snows of Canada, gunning down anyone who stands in their way. Even poor old Joe doesn't escape the episode unscathed, his hand being hit by a pistol shot, but the episode's most shocking moment is easily the scene where convicts Rial and Mane escape from their prison van. That's more like it, Captain. Good thinking. While guard Pierre is interrogating Mane, Rial kicks the heavy metal van door into the back of Pierre's head, no doubt causing him serious injury if not killing him outright. Yes, that black bit at the bottom looks particularly sharp. Pierre? Pierre! Realizing that something is wrong, Pierre's partner Eddie gets on the radio to report the breakout, but is shot dead by Rial before he can even finish the message. Work detail number three here. We're in trouble. There's been. <laughs> Now, of course, we've seen characters get shot in Super Marionation shows before, but rarely in such graphic detail. A sudden burst of blood appears on Eddie's chest as the bullet hits him, and the puppet slumps forward in his chair, his sightless eyes still staring ahead. Well, it adds a touch of realism. It's such a quick scene that it usually slips the attention of broadcast censors, but it's one of the more uncomfortably realistic scenes of violence in any Jerry Anderson series. It was all your idea. Who's going to believe that? No further mention is made of Pierre and Eddie, so we can assume that they, along with the unfortunate gun crew that Rial and Mane also took shots at, all died. Well, I don't know the answer, Dad. As for Joe, although he ends the episode with his arm in a sling, he did at least shoot down Mane before taking a bullet himself. <laughs> Mane then spends the rest of the episode moaning in agony, proving that Joe prefers his victims to suffer for a bit rather than killing them instantly. Well, sometimes. Number 1. Joe Murders Coletti from Hijacked <laughs> I see, that's, that's very interesting. In The Birthday, Sam Louver describes the events of Hijacked as Joe's first real assignment. And there's certainly no denying that this is perhaps the definitive Joe 90 episode. It's a perfect example of both the show's format and some of its more unsavory elements. This is the end of the line, kid. The very end. As Joe is thrown into a lair of ruthless gun runners with no backup and no real plan. Hey! Does he get shot at? Oh yes. Does he suffer physical injury? Of course. 
does he ultimately murder Mario Coletti, the leader of the Gunrunners, with a hand grenade? You bet! Over here, Coletti! Wait, what? Where are you? Close enough to kill you, Coletti. Now, we have to be fair here and point out that Coletti was armed with a machine gun and was actively trying to murder Joe, who at that point had lost his own pistol. <laughs> Now, while you could make the argument that Joe was acting in self-defense here, it certainly seems like a massive overreaction to outright murder Coletti in so brutal and gory a manner, particularly given Sam Louver's comment at the start of the episode that this man was responsible for hundreds of deaths and thus really should have had to stand trial for his crimes. Every year, hundreds of people are cut down by guns supplied by Mario Coletti. Joe did go on to take one or two more lives throughout the course of the series, but none quite as spectacularly violently as he did here. And we have to wonder if any of these murders carried out by other people's thoughts in his head caused him any mental trauma later in life. Although given that they later talk about the deaths of both Coletti and the sergeant over cake and ice cream on Joe's birthday, he was probably fine. Great.